Hey everybody, just a quick trigger warning before we get started here. We talk about women in the church, so of course we're going to talk about a lot of misogyny and a lot of sexism and abuse. So beware of that, be ready for that. If you aren't ready for that, skip it, catch us on the next one, or watch it when you're having a different kind of day. I'd also like to point out that I am a man, and I have no experience being a woman. So I don't know the full picture. I just know what I've seen but I don't know what some of you have experienced. So I'm gonna try my best here, but please forgive me if there's any gaps. And I'd love to hear your feedback. I know the crap out of women. Hey everybody, I just wanna talk for a moment about income inequality. Income and wealth inequality is higher in the United States than in almost any other developed country in the world. And it's rising, so that's fun. In 2021, the annual wages rose the fastest for the top 1% of earners, while the bottom 90% of the American workforce, you know, the ones who actually work, uh, saw their actual earnings fall 0.2%, which of course is so encouraging. Good for that 1%. They're, They're just nailing it, aren't they? And not only are people not getting paid what they deserve, but there's a huge income gap across racial groups. So you know how like America used to have slavery and then there was segregation and and then there were things like making sure that black people didn't get the same advantages as white people, like didn't have the same housing availability. For example, black women earn 64 cents for every dollar earned by a white man and black men earn 87 cents for every dollar that a white man earns. And then women in general make 83 cents for every dollar earned by a white man. And this needs to change. We really need to do something about this. Things like expanding educational opportunities and investing in communities locally with cash support and other tools. We can change how and who our economy works for. America is wealthy enough to ensure that each person can make ends meet. We've all had those situations where all of a sudden we need to pay for something we weren't expecting, like our car breaks down or our pet is sick or we break a tooth, all of a sudden there's an expense that we weren't expecting. But 50% of Americans don't have $400 in cash on hand to deal with those kind of emergencies. How do three men in their 30s not have $800 between them? They're... The it's economy is in oh, shambles. Have you right. the, taken the, 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 the marketplace right now? Dow Jones. Stop Oil talking, price. God damn it. But the good news is that over 100 guaranteed income pilot projects have been announced nationwide since 2017. So people are on the ground working for solutions. People work hard and they're not making enough money. We need to hold the companies accountable. But we also need to invest in our communities. It's not a matter of people need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. It's a matter of the system is broken and we need to do what we can to fix it. See, the world isn't fair. But the solution isn't to say, oh, well, life's not fair. The solution is to do what we can to make it more fair. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for liking and subscribing and commenting and all that other wonderful stuff you do because you're all so wonderful. Um, I put the links down below for the social media as well as our merch so you can get some of that. And uh, yeah, and there's also the Patreon. So uh, I always love that support because sometimes um, what happens is preachers don't like that I criticize them and then they copyright claim me even though it is fair use. And then uh, I get really annoyed and I'm fighting with it online. But when I have that Patreon, um, I know that, you know, People are supporting me and making sure that I can live. And I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate all of you. Thanks. The Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Protestant denomination in the United States of America and the world's largest Baptist denomination. It started in 1845 when they split from other Baptists who were like, hey, is it maybe really evil of us to own humans? And they're like, "Uh, no, we think God is okay with slavery. In their defense, when you read the Bible, he is. Don't worry, they have since repented of this. In uh, 1995, you know, 
way back when I was starting high school. And in the last couple of years, they have really been under fire for covering up abuse. An investigative report commissioned by the Southern Baptist Convention says top leaders of the church group mishandled sexual abuse allegations for years. The findings have rocked religious circles in the nation's largest Protestant denomination. Southern Baptist leaders say that they will release a secret list of hundreds of pastors and staff members accused of sexual abuse. The announcement comes after a scathing 288-page report detailed how the committee mishandled sex abuse allegations and stonewalled numerous survivors. As well as accusations of white supremacy. Says that white supremacy is at work inside the SBC. What about the timing of this? Why are you bringing this up now? Well, be because of it's, it's actually a response to the Southern Baptist Convention's position that critical race theory is inconsistent with their theology as they see it. And so in their theological seminaries, there will be no discourse, there will be no teaching, no conversation about how race affects our society. So, because so you're saying you do the not recognize the that the, the Southern Baptist Convention is adopting the theory um, no. that recognizes systemic racism as part of American society. You're saying that that's not true. No, I didn't say that's true. I didn't say there isn't systemic racism. That's obvious. I'm saying that we do not prescribe to critical race theory. And that's what was part of what you just said. We, we do not prescribe to it. That's a, that's a false narrative. Okay, uh, we so, believe in gospel. Uh, we believe in gospel reconciliation. Uh, yeah, we really don't want people to know what we did. So if you could not teach CRT, that would really help us out a lot. So they said, hey, we need to take a stand here. We need to draw a line in the sand. And so recently they kicked out one of their biggest churches for having a woman pastor. Yeah, Glenn, Saddleback Church, like you see behind me, has more than a dozen locations in Southern California, and according to reports, a weekly attendance of 30,000, founded by pastor and bestselling author Rick Warren. Well, now, the Southern Baptist Convention has ousted the congregation for having a female pastor. The vote comes over whether the local mega church, founded by pastor and bestselling author Rick Warren, has the right to have a woman pastor. The Southern Baptist Convention officially opposes women as pastors, and this controversy dates back to 2021 when Pastor Warren ordained three women as pastors. I'm excited to have a woman in charge. The world's moving too fast. Enough already. You see, for a lot of Christians, having to hear a woman's opinion is a grave sin. Despite the fact that the majority of church attendees are women. The Bible is kind of sexist, and therefore so are a lot of churches, and so are a lot of Christians. Just needs to be stated clearly, I know that we are all on the same page, but unfortunately these sorts of things go out on this thing called the internet, <laughs> in our pockets. Uh, it's actually just called the internet. You don't have to add the in our pockets part. And it is just important to state clearly that in no way, shape, or form does the Bible teach or commend that women are to be ordained pastors, ordained elders. So, Yay, round of applause. You see, it all started when Eve ate the fruit. Because Adam was created first, and Eve was created for Adam. And then also the Eve was deceived into sin while Adam was not. But Adam did sin because he also ate the fruit. Are you saying that he wasn't deceived into that sin and that he just did it because? If Eve was the one who was deceived and Adam wasn't, then he just straight up sinned on purpose? Isn't that worse? And here's a fun fact. The fruit in question is usually portrayed as an apple, but... Did you know that the Bible doesn't actually say what kind of fruit it is? I think, personally, that this is a subtle nod to the fact that the whole story is made up and uh, none of it matters. But in spite of the clarity of Scripture, this has become a monstrous issue in our day. One divine statement answers the question, what does the Bible say about women preachers? It's in verse 35. 
the last part of the verse, it is improper for a woman to speak in church. That's not ambiguous. That's not at all unclear. Yeah, this really old book that was written by old misogynists is very clear on this. What we're talking about there in 1 Corinthians 11.3 is order, and maybe even in function, but not in dignity, equality, and value, but in terms of role. And men need to know that their role is not their rank, okay? And that the responsibility in their role as a leader is to not be oppressive, but to serve those that they are shepherds over. I love how independent my wife is, and because of that, I will not let her speak. That came out wrong. You know, we're told all of our lives, you can be anything you want to be. Well, you know, that's not really how God's plan works. He has a, a, a structure in place, and God gives us our roles. So, you know, for the example, I don't have the role of a mother. I'm not a mother, but that does not make me less of a woman. Exactly. Right? You know, if I don't have the role of pastor, that does not make yes. me less than Kevin. <laughs> that does not make me less of a Christian because I'm not a pastor. You know, my worth comes from God. And I've brought this up before, but if you have been part of an evangelical church at any point in your life, it's very likely that you've seen this diagram. And of course, this is more about roles in marriage, <laughs> which, believe me, we'll get to. But they say over and over again that it doesn't mean that you are less than your husband. It's just a different role. Or the woman isn't less than a man. They just have different roles. But they always include God in that list. So it's obviously a hierarchy, right? Or God is equal to us? But according to these people, you can teach kids and other women. But once those boys hit 15 or the age of accountability... They know more than you and can't learn from you. You know, well, the article was something about women believe that they're limited because they can't preach to men. But if you take all the women in the world, and I think every child under 15, it makes up for 75% of the population. Women can do a lot of work. Yeah, they just have different roles. It's fine. Some people preach the word and some people organize the potluck. Thus how the church should be constantly striving to identify, disciple, and train women in the church, in theology, in scripture, in the languages, in hermeneutics, that they might, as older women, train up and teach and disciple younger women that they might be teaching, that they might be instructing. Excuse me, everyone. Did anyone notice that there are no women on the Gender Equality Commission? There's a lady right next to you. Oh, oh wait, no. It's just a very beautiful man. Yes, okay, we are... They, they might be helping to raise up the next generation of young women to be courageous, faithful women, mothers, teachers in the church for generations to come. But I, as a man, just better not hear what they're saying. That's the great teaching responsibility of older women to teach younger women the necessity of the home being the priority, loving husbands, loving children, being subjected to your husband so that the Word of God will not be dishonored. Uh, listen, you did a great job setting it up and getting the snacks ready, but we'll take it from here. You know what? There's a difference today between men and women, but our world today wants to blur all difference. And so anybody who just gets up and says, hey, we're going to treat our sons and daughters differently, people freak out about that because they have this weird sense of equality and fairness. It's not biblical. Okay, what does the Bible teach? That there's a big difference. Now look, so this, of course, is hate pastor Steven Anderson, who has been banned from over 30 countries because of his hate speech. Um, and here he is complaining about people wanting rights. Some people are already heading to the comments to say, oh, here you go. You quote a hate pastor and say that it's all Christians. <laughs> no, I'm not saying it's all Christians, but I am saying it's a lot of Christians who agree with this hate pastor. God created us male and female. And so we are to raise our young boys to be men, fathers, dads, 
leaders in the church, we are to raise young women to be godly women, our young girls to be godly women, godly mothers, godly leaders in the church, consistent with everything that Scripture would say about women. I don't need to learn how to be a good mom. I shouldn't teach my little girls how to be a good mom. And what I've learned through this process is that there are a lot of women who are hurt just by what's going on right now. And that really grieved me. When I say what's going on right now, I, mean, I just mean in our culture, like maybe you feel oppressed or, or lesser than in any way. And I hate that because I don't see that in God's word. And, and if I'm reading that or if I've ever communicated anything that could be interpreted that, then I've missed the mark by such an incredible chasm. So any reading of the Bible that is sexist is just a misinterpretation. So for instance, in Deuteronomy 22, when it says, if however the charge is true, and no proof of the young woman's virginity can be found, she shall be brought to the door of her father's house, and there the men of her town shall stone her to death. She has done an outrageous thing in Israel by being promiscuous while still in her father's house. You must purge the evil from among you. So to interpret that as sexist would be a misinterpretation? Yes, Christians haven't always been consistent in how we've treated women. I actually disagree. I think the church has been pretty consistent in the way it has treated women. It's been centuries of women being seen as just baby makers and bottle washers, being executed as a heretic or a witch for, you know, having an opinion. And there's some difficult passages we need to unpack. But when we go back to the creation account and we look through scripture of the person of Jesus, we see that the Bible upholds women with the highest dignity and the highest respect. Like how in Leviticus 12, it says that if a woman gives birth to a boy, she is unclean for seven days. But if she gives birth to a girl, she is unclean for 14 days? Why does giving birth to a girl make her unclean twice as long? Or how about when Lot valued his daughters less than the two random dudes he just met? and offered them to the crowd to save these two random dudes. Or like all the times that the Bible lists women with other objects and property. Like if they're not property in today's society, why is it listed on the Bible that they are? This is on the top of women as property. Um, women yeah. as property. Where, yeah. where are women listed as property? That's what um, I want This is in the Old Testament. Where? I said. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, see, this, I need specifics. And when I get specifics, mm -hmm. then I have to go look up the passage and see what it meant. Aren't you a famous apologist who goes around arguing for the existence of the Christian God and for the Bible being like legit his word? And doesn't that Bible also say to always be ready to give an answer? How can you not think of a single example of the Bible listing women with other property? Like maybe in the Ten Commandments? as quoted here by the world's most boring puppet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servants. Like seriously, how do kids enjoy this? His ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Anything that belongs to your neighbor. It's pretty clear here that the wife is one of the things that belongs to her husband. We've already covered the fact that just a few verses earlier, the Bible affirms that the wife is worthy of honor equal to that of her husband in regard to their children. It wouldn't make sense for the biblical author to then immediately undermine his own teaching by saying that women are on the same level as houses and animals. First of all, you don't really need to dismiss the idea that a biblical author would do something that doesn't make sense. And a lot of the writings of the Old Testament aren't by the same author. They're a mashing together of different writings. And a list of 10 rules is very likely to be a collection of different writings. And children are supposed to look up to their mothers according to the Bible. That doesn't mean that other places women aren't seen as property when it's not a mother and child situation. We've all seen those men who will yell at their kids for not respecting their mom and then go to the bar and talk trash about their wife. People are pretty good at being inconsistent. You know, I have to say something. I didn't particularly like that joke. I love my wife. Oh, sure, kid. I was... I respect her. And before I tell a joke, I like to ask myself, if she was sitting right next to me, would I tell this joke? That comment crossed the line. I don't think it's very funny. 
Another point worthy of consideration is that the Torah does not permit a wife to be sold like houses, oxen, or donkeys. In fact, the Bible explicitly forbids a husband from treating a woman as a slave and selling her, even if she was a war captive from another nation. Deuteronomy chapter 21. No, no, not even if, just if. There are plenty of times you are allowed to sell a woman, like when the Bible gives instructions on how to sell your daughter as a slave. But there were also some cases where they weren't allowed to sell women they took in war, but that was usually commanded per war or per genocide. Like in Numbers 31, where they were allowed to take women who had not known a man as their own. Moses was angry with the officers of the army, with the captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, who had come from the battle. And Moses said to them, have you kept all the women alive? Now you're going, wait, 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 this doesn't bode well. Why would he, why would he I say that about the women? Like he's angry at the women. Well, who are the ones that caused the children of Israel to be seduced? Who were the ones that caused the children of Israel to get involved in immorality? It was these women. Nothing changes, does it? It's not men who need to control themselves and have some integrity. It's the women who seduced them. They're the ones who need to be punished. So he asked them. They, they were the ones that had more culpability. Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones and every woman who has known a man intimately, but keep alive for yourselves the young girls who have not known a man intimately. Keep the young ladies for yourself. Thus says the Lord. Don't worry, though. They'll marry them, which is so sweet and so romantic. I mean, this chapter doesn't say that, but we'll just infer that based on another book of the Bible that talks about the result of a different genocide. And we'll power through the horrors of that chapter to try to make it seem morally justified. For a full month, then you may go to her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. If you are not pleased with her, let her go wherever she wishes. You must not sell her or treat her as a slave, since you have dishonored her. Okay, so this might seem like a confusing and bizarre passage on the surface, but this law is ultimately designed for the protection of a female war captive. Here are some details to take notice of. First, Israelite men are commanded to not treat these women as mere objects. Other nations' armies could simply rape female captives of war and throw them away like nothing. This is an example of something that we see over and over again when people are defending the evils of the Bible. It wasn't as bad as other things people did at the time, so we're good. Yeah, maybe if we're playing the which ancient text is less sexist game, that argument could be made. But you are the people saying that this is the inspired work of an all-loving God who was the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the people who are saying we need to live our lives based on this book. It doesn't matter if other books were more evil. They're not the ones that you're telling people to listen to. Such a thing was not allowed in the nation governed by God's Torah. If a man desired one of these women, he couldn't just have sexual relations with her. He was explicitly commanded to give her the dignity of marriage. Second, before the marriage could be consummated, Female captives were to be allowed a month-long period of mourning. This is out of respect for the woman's emotional and psychological health, seeing as how her family had probably died in the conquest. During this period of mourning, she is to shave her head and trim her nails. Forced marriage, even if they give you a chance to be sad about all the people, the person they are marrying killed, it's not a happy or a dignified thing. It's really horrific. 
certainly true in the Old Testament. We read a lot of horrendous stories and we see women treated in some really appalling ways. But actually the reason for that is because the Bible doesn't shy away from telling a, a true story about both the extreme highs and lows of human behavior. But it doesn't tell these stories as if God is against it. God seems to be on board at the very least and usually he's the one commanding it to be done. And in that sense, I'm actually grateful for what we find there because it means we can't accuse the Bible of holding some kind of religious cover-up or trying to, trying to disguise the way that people have been mistreated. Actually, it lays it all bare in a very clear way, I think, for us to learn from so that we don't go and do likewise, but also because we consistently see throughout Scripture God protecting, often through legal codes, sometimes through direct intervention, the very women who, who the men within their culture are taking advantage of and abusing. But let's take a step back from a 30,000 foot view and ask as a whole, how does the Bible view women? Well, if you just go back to the Genesis creation beginning account, you'll notice a few things. First off, the Bible mentions women in the creation story. Many ancient stories didn't even think women were worthy of mention. But not only mentions them, women are equal image bearers, says Genesis 1:27, with men maybe different roles, but equal value as image bearers of God. Third, the Bible in the creation account, it's a progressive creation that's growing. And the last thing God creates is the woman. It's as if the story is saying, God says, I'm finally done. I can't do any better than this. I mean, yeah, women are made last, but only after Adam couldn't find a partner among the animals and or only after Adam was super lonely and God was like, all oh, right, I guess I should make him a woman. Now the Genesis story does say that woman is a helper, but it doesn't mean the assistant for what the man wants to do. It means somebody who's his equal, but his opposite, who will partner with him to accomplish the tasks that God has called him and her together to do. Women's rights. Now that's more a man's thing, isn't it? Sorry about that. Um, no, definitely a woman's thing. Nah, my father's a woman's rights activist. Your dad? Yeah. No, your mum? No, mum, no. Dad wouldn't allow that. No way. If we start on the very first chapter in Genesis chapter one, we read that God made humankind in his image, male and female, he created them. And it's fascinating to me that it didn't need to spell that out. You know, it could have just said it made man in his image, but someone was very, being very particular about the fact when we talk about these unique beings, equally and significantly made to image God, to represent him, we're talking about male and female. And also, let's not forget that we've already learned here that the reason that women can't teach men is because of that same creation story that you say is so pro-women. Because Adam was created first, and Eve was created for Adam. And then also the Eve was deceived into sin while Adam was not. The result of the fall, woman bears a curse in two areas. One, and it's ubiquitous and universal, pain in childbearing. Secondly, a desire because of her fallen heart to upset the divine order of authority and submission and to want to dominate her husband. Again, yes, I'm not going to kink shame. If that's what they're into, that's what they're into, as long as everybody's on board. This is the universal reality in marriage to one degree or another. The woman will desire to control. The man will have to rule over her. That's as universal as pain in childbearing. That's right, because according to the Bible, wives are to be submissive to their husbands. Three biggest weapons that people who take these interpretations use to support their claims, and usually the three biggest red flags for feminists reading this passage, are the following phrases. Number one, the beginning instruction to be subject or submit to one's husband. Number two, the command against external adorning. And number three, the reference to women being the weaker vessel. Again, if we were to simply take these verses at face value, then the Bible would appear to be a very behind the times sexist book. However, not a single one of those phrases are as simple or as one-sided as they may appear. So buckle up, baby. So 
explain this to me. Why is the God who created everything in the universe, including DNA and RNA and black holes and supernovas and, and goats and bumblebees, why does that God do such a bad job at writing his book? I mean, I know that everyone has different talents and maybe God just isn't a writer, but to make a book that is supposed to be his message for humanity, but then for the next couple thousand years, it just causes confusion and division. We have to talk about context. We have to talk about the original culture and so on and so on, which would make sense if it was written by people, but it's supposed to be inspired by God? Why didn't he make something that would be universally understood? He's putting the effort in already to communicate with humans. Put that extra bit of effort in. Does the Bible talk about submission for the wife? A absolutely. But it also says in Ephesians 5.21 that there's submission that is mutual. At the same token, there is an element where the Bible talks about the husband is the head and the wife is the responder in submission. And anytime uh, I talk about this idea of submission, I like to remind anybody who's struggling with that idea to remember what God calls a man to do. He is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. How does Christ love the church? He dies for it. So submit or die, right? So it kind of puts things into perspective. That's always the way it's argued, isn't it? Men are supposed to love their wives like Christ loved the church, which they then take to mean that, well, Jesus died for the church, but not the other interpretation where Jesus left the church to fend for herself with the promise that he would return really, really soon. Dad! Hey, hey there, boy! Man, you got big. How long's it been? Three, four months? Ten years. Ten years? Man, I gotta lay off the peyote. <laughs> and you can say all you want that, yeah, you would die for someone, you would lay down your life for someone, but the opportunity doesn't come up that often to, to prove this. And if it does, would you actually die for her? Or were you bluffing the whole time so that she would submit to you? Would you swallow a whole sword? A sword? Okay, I probably wouldn't do that one either. Yeah, maybe you should make it more realistic things you'd do, some of the things. Like what? Uh, I would hang out with you. Oh, that's good. That's good, that's really that's good. That's not bad, that's a lyric of mine you can use. Okay, ladies, here's the definition for submission. Choosing to yield to another's will. Now, you may already be reacting in a negative way to that definition, but, but hold on, be patient. So in submission is this choosing to yield to another's will. So as that pertains to marriage, wives, you are choosing to yield to your husband. You're choosing to say, I'm going to allow you to lead. Because from what the Bible has to say, husbands are the leaders in their home. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. But it's a choice, ladies, that you make to say, I understand that my role's different and I need to choose to yield, to allow my husband to lead. Is it a choice though, or is it a decree from God? I mean, I know everything's a choice and we have free will, but if it's a commandment and you believe you're gonna burn in hell if you don't do it, kind of takes the choice part out of it, right? Paul is saying here that wives should submit themselves to their own husbands as a service to the Lord. So take him completely out of the picture, even if he's tripping, even if he's not doing what he's supposed to do. Whenever you submit yourself to your husband, you are submitting yourself first and foremost to God and second of all to your husband. So take the person you are supposed to be submitting to out of the equation and just submit to him because you love God? Doesn't matter if he's a dick, doesn't matter if he's abusive, just submit to him because God? Inherent in a choice means you're not just under the thumb of someone, you're not just being controlled by someone. You're an active participant in how submission should look and how God intended it to work. So it's not that God's saying to us ladies that we have no value, you have no purpose or meaning, you just do what you're told. No, inherent in the definition of submission is that you understand that because you have a lot to offer, because you come into marriage as a helpmate to your spouse, only one person can lead. And you are choosing to submit to your husband and allowing him to go before you. Yeah, because there's never been a situation where things were led by a team evil and to praise those who do good. Peter here finds himself in the middle of an elongated point on the importance of submission to institutions such as government, employment, 
and marriage. He is saying, be subject to the governing authorities. Likewise, be subject to your masters. Likewise, be subject to your husband. Likewise, be subject to your wives. Likewise, be subject to the institution of marriage for the Lord's sake. If we begin to put this verse in its proper context, we will see that it is more about a mutual submission to the Lord in marriage than it is about one sex or gender being more important or powerful than another. Did, did you catch that? Your masters. Because wives in these passages are lumped in with slaves. But, you know, context and culture and you're still equal. And so for us to be a slave to Christ, to be a slave to God, it means that we submit to what he wants for us. Now, this is where the other side of this comes in of we are sons because he's a good father. So we must submit to his will, but his will for us is that of a good father toward a son. And it's the same for marriage. And it's the same for marriage. My wife is like my son. Hmm, so romantic. Honey, you're like my son. You know, for marriage, my will for my wife is good. I want her highest good. I have her best interests at heart. And so for her to submit to my leadership, to my will, is because I want the best interests of her at heart. This may shock you, Annie, but I come from a long line of wives and mothers. Many do. But I ran away from it my whole life. I refused to give Santa a Christmas list because I didn't want to depend on any man for anything. And now look at me. I'm Betty Crocker. I'm Martha Stewart. I'm one of the Steppenwolf wives. But guys are over here saying, obey me. But don't say anything mean to me because that would make me feel sad. Is demasculating their man. And what I mean here is using a tone of voice that is disrespectful to that man, right? So, for instance, the man says, How you doing? And you're like, I'm fine. He says, What? I said I'm fine, right? Like, negative tone of voice, talking down to him. Right, because you've never had a bad day. You really think you can live with someone 24 7 and never catch them on a bad day? Never catch them in an off moment? Do you know what marriage is? You're just a poor little fragile man. That's what you are. Cutting him off, um, demeaning him, devaluing him, criticizing him in public, in front of people. All this stuff, ladies, it needs to stop because it's a sign that you're trying to usurp his authority or that you're not respecting him as the God-given leader in your home. And you will respect my authority! Dear wives, can I just share with you that there are a million prostitutes trying to get the attention of your husband. And when I say that, I hope you understand what I'm saying. Within advertising and out in public because of immodest fashion and at the beach and you, you, know, you name it, men are bombarded with sexual imagery all the time and the women that are participating in that, they obviously know what they're doing. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're in essence, prostitutes. They're probably doing it in advertising, of course, to gain money. And uh, in other scenarios, you're doing it to gain money, just like a prostitute, not you know, necessarily engaging in sexual activity, but heading in that direction. They're in that group, you see. And so men are bombarded all the time. And, and so it's you know, wise for wives to be aware of that and to, you know, well, like the Bible says, don't defraud both husbands and wives. Don't defraud one another of conjugal rights and everything that goes along with that, okay? Um, okay, first of all, sex work is work. If someone chooses to do that as their job, that's their choice, and you don't need to look down on them for it. People always talk about sex workers as if they're selling their body, but they don't think of the fact that people in really physically demanding jobs are also selling their body. That people in high stress jobs are also selling their mind and selling their body because high stress jobs cause stress, which have physical ramifications. All jobs are us selling our body. That's the commodity our bosses are buying. So if you're gonna look down on sex workers, just look down on every job. But weren't men supposed to be the stronger sex according to you people? Why do you demand that you be treated like weak little beings with no self-control? Stop depriving your husbands 
of sex. And I know all the husbands in the world just said, amen. Now, let me be clear about what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a season whenever you might not be at your best self or whenever you are, uh, you're, you have a low libido or your desires down. That's understandable. I'm talking about an intentional decision, whether it's verbalized or you've made that decision in your heart that you have shut the shop down until further notice. Ladies, this is against God. And you have no idea that you are literally setting not only your man up for failure, but your own marriage as well. And God forbid you're doing this on purpose to try to force the man to have some sort of relationship outside of your marriage so that you have an excuse to get out of a marriage that you don't want to be in at all. This, of course, is a disgusting mindset that has been used by abusive husbands to use God and the Bible to demand sex from their wives even after they've been treating them like crap. Because in this culture, they don't see their wives as people. They see them as personal blow-up dolls. They see them as objects, as property. It's disgusting, and pastors need to stop this kind of talk. But I'm sure this goes both ways, right? As much as I hate to say it, ladies, you need to stop looking for affirmation from your husband as well. Because listen, your husband may or may not affirm you and give you the attention that you are needing and that you are desiring. So what do you do in those instances? Do you look for it from another man? Do you look for it online? Do you look for it in your career, right? You need to find that place of affirmation from God and God alone and the assurance to know that you are in God's divine purpose and will for your life and you need to receive that affirmation from God because he is the only one that's going to ever be able to fill any sort of void that's in your life. If you deny your husband sex, then it's your fault if he cheats on you. But don't be so needy to expect affection and affirmation from your husband. And God forbid they want to have a career. As they need to stop neglecting their responsibility to their family because of a demanding career. Listen, I know that there is a precedent in the Bible for women to work outside the home or inside the home. I'm not suggesting that women should not have a successful career. There's obviously a precedent set for that, an example for that in Proverbs 31. But what I'm talking about is whenever your work and your desire for career and corporate advancement supersedes your desire to fulfill your God-given role as a supportive wife to your husband and a loving uh, mother to your children. By the way, no one's ever asked me that question. No one asked me, where are your kids or who's taking care of them? By the way, who is taking care of the kids? Right now? My mom, babe, everything's fine. Right. Is that we don't want to chase, spend our most fertile years chasing after a career. Fertile years. Are you breeding stock or a human person? I know this one is going to get a lot of mixed feelings right now. And, you know, this, again, this doesn't represent every Christian woman, but this does represent a lot yeah. of Christian women. And in yeah, fact, again, women. and this is like, true, yeah. and a lot of women who don't even believe in the Bible yeah. are saying, you know what, as, as we're learning more about our bodies, more about our fertility, as many of us are wrestling with infertility, as we're learning more about our cycle, our fertile, yes. fertile years, how our eggs decline over time, we're starting to yeah. realize, you know what, we have been buying into this lie that we should as women spend our youngest, most healthy, most fertile, yeah. most energetic years building our career and slaving away, exhausted, you know, barely sleeping, just crushing mm -hmm. our bodies. And then maybe sometime <laughs> down the road, like sometime in those golden years of like 40, you know, when you're basically hitting menopause, then we're told, I okay, know. then maybe you can settle down and like yeah. think about getting married, think about starting a family, or maybe you're married, you know, but by all means, don't even think about kids because that will interrupt every possible career path that you're pursuing. <laughs> and many women have bought into this and now are backtracking and saying, whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, whoa. I don't know if this is actually as good as it sounds. Is this why certain groups have made sure that America is one of the only developed countries that doesn't have mandatory paid maternity leave because they want you to think that you have to choose between one or the other? Is this also why they're so against men being stay-at-home dads, if that's what the couple chooses? Uh, mothering and homemaking are huge and glorious jobs. What children need at age 1, 5, 6, 14, 18, what they need is simply a 
amazing. And what it calls forth from a woman's creativity and a woman's heart and a woman's mind personally for each one of these little ones that are coming along or just the home, a home here where, where ministry can happen. And you're not enslaved by anybody's clock. You can say, I'm going to work my tail off for King Jesus, but I don't want anybody to pay me for it. I'm going to do it right here in this neighborhood with my husband's connections and my connections. We're going to lavish grace on people's lives. So I'm calling for ministry full-time when I say don't work full-time if you've got a family. Turn your family into ministry. Turn your family into a, a global dream for what this family might become or what this man might be, what we might be together as we are a, a home. Listen, I'm not against stay-at-home parenting. I think it's great. I love that I get to stay at home with this little guy. Hey, Jager, you want to say hi to everybody? Hey, this is my Jager. If that's what the parents decide and it works for them, that is great and more power to them. That's right. If you want to bake a pie, that's great. If you want to have a career, that's great too. Do both or neither. doesn't matter. Just don't judge what someone else has decided to do. I mean, we're all just trying to find the right path for us as individuals on this earth. And yeah. so it's like, we're not realizing, you know, you hear people talk about like, oh, the ticking clock and all this, but it, there is actually reality. Yes. So that, like, yeah. it's not just a joke there. There is a, there is an end. And many of us are realizing, you know what? It makes sense. Yeah. Like having kids younger, when you're more fertile, yeah. when you have more energy, like, hmm, maybe we should rethink yeah. this bill of goods that society has just been pushing on us through the waves of fem feminism really over the last, yeah. I don't know, how many decades. Well, and it's not an accident that we were built this way and we were made this way. I mean, God is such a good designer, such a good creator, and he made us to be most fertile in our <laughs> most youthful years. Most youthful years. <laughs> and I just think back to when I was like in my 20s as compared to now in my 30s, and <laughs> my energy does not look the same. And I, I mean, you might be able to tell, I don't know how much I'm in video, but I am like, you know, just like how eight many weeks, weeks pregnant? at this point, eight weeks away from okay. giving birth. And I just, I'm like, I think if I was 24, I'd probably be feeling totally different. <laughs> I'm 34. And I, you know, that was God's plan for me. I right. wanted to get married younger. I wanted to have kids younger, but it's also that open hands of surrender. We yes. don't ultimately control these things like ultimately, but yeah. we do have choices that we can make. And if we are intentionally putting that off and, and saying, no, like maybe we need to take a step back. Maybe we need to rethink mm -hmm. this because it is something, I think having children, embracing motherhood, it is something beautiful. And I, I, I love when I see some of these younger women actually, you know, if they have the opportunity to get married and to see them starting their families, I just think it's yeah, so exciting I know. and really awesome. There's so much to unpack here. They have pursued a career with Girl Defined, and they have become very successful in their career. They also say that God has a perfect plan. But Kristen and her husband were unable to have children. And I'm not judging for that, and I know it must be really tough, and I'm not trying to say, oh, look at them, haha. No, not at all. But if you're saying that it's all part of God's plan, then why did they adopt children? Isn't that going against God's plan? Do you think that my wife is just uh, struggling every day with what to do with all her free time? <laughs> she has eight kids to deal with. Twelve now. I guess if you can't leave the country and you're against birth control and the world thinks you're a hate man, then I guess you gotta create your own fans? Except we know that most of them are gonna hate them a lot when they grow up. And then she has me to deal with. That's enough to deal with. She's busy. She's got a, she doesn't need a career. Except for when his wife started her own swimsuit company because regular children's swimsuits are too revealing of the bodies of children. Hi, this is Susanna of Cute Uncovered, modest swimwear fashion. Here's a little model of a swim dress I made to show you the design of this. First of all, you will notice it's all in one piece. Even the bottoms are sewn together at the waist here, and the leggings underneath are also join at the waist. That way, even if the kids are playing wild, even if you're being active in the water, it will not ride up, it will not expose a midriff. And to make the swim dress easy to put on and take off, there is a zipper in the back. And that brings us to the next thing that evangelical women and girls have to deal with, corrupting men 
by them maybe seeing a part of a woman. I want to talk to the men for just a second. Men, when I talk about temptation, you know what one of the greatest temptations is, and it's her. You can't walk out of this building, you can't go anywhere in public and not see flesh, nudity, uh, seductresses, dressing to appeal, dressing to look good. Stop dressing to look good. Wear a giant potato sack. Okay, you're right. I should shut up. You know what I'm talking about. And short and low, and here are men who want to live right. Men that want to be holy. They got nowhere to turn because in a 360 degree circle, it's everywhere. Yeah, we just wanted to be holy. Leave us alone. We can't be holy if there are ankles and shoulders everywhere. But the problem is, is that they have to see it in church. No man ought to have to fight that in church. Ladies, girls, when you get up to get dressed to come to church, you need to realize you're coming to the holy house of God. You ought not to come here to show off, wait, your legs. And if you're constantly having to fight to stay decent, you got the wrong wardrobe on. And not just for church, but for anywhere else. I guess in this society, being male and an asshole makes you worthy of our time. These are the same people saying that men are the leaders and men are in charge and men should control everything, but they can't even control themselves when they see a skirt that doesn't go past the knee. And uh, women often think that this is unfair, and I guess it is, but it, it, it's a biological fact that men are different than women, right? And they're different in a lot of ways. And uh, for that reason, this is why scripture has more to say about women's dress than it does men's dress, because men are sexual creatures. And women aren't? Then why do you want to have sex with them? Uh, who are designed by God to be attracted sexually uh, to a woman's form. And I'm just keeping it, you know, unspecific and fairly general here. I'm hoping you can fill in the blanks. But men like to look at women. But isn't that like a you problem? But listen, ladies, I'm seeing way too many Christian ladies just posting pics. Some of them are inappropriate. Some of them are just featuring or accentuating certain parts of their body. And others, y'all, just straight up vanity. When you're just posting pictures of yourself all the time on social media, Listen, it is really a sign that there's something that's lacking within you, that you are longing for some sort of attention or some sort of affirmation. There's a void deep down within you, and you're feeling as though you need to get that affirmation from people online who are always commenting and telling you how beautiful you are and this, that, and the other, and that feeds your ego. But what you don't realize is that it actually makes you look worse. It actually makes you look insecure. So unfollow them if it's a problem for you. It's really that simple. And I don't know if you're the one who should be talking about looking insecure on the internet. Negative tone of voice, talking down to him, cutting him off, um, demeaning him, devaluing him, criticizing him in public, in front of people. All this stuff, ladies, it needs to stop. I think it's the same thing with modesty. A lot of people now deride the idea of modesty and like a woman covering up or dressing modestly because they think that any form of modesty is legalism but it's the same thing it mm -hmm. actually modesty is actually speaking to a state of the heart Correct. that is then manifested through what we wear so it's not right. exactly about how many inches above your knee we see this all the time whenever there is a pushback for a dumb rule that the church preaches the reason becomes that it's actually a matter of the heart i mean you still have to do the thing but it's actually a matter of the heart your skirt is although right. those things matter right. i mean there you are standards yeah. but that's not it, it, the external is not primary. Right. It's secondary. It's a consequence of what's in the heart. Yeah. And all of this is only scratching the surface of what women have to deal with in this environment. And not to mention, 
like I said in our intro, it's not like the rest of the world is exactly a safe place. I will probably never fully understand what women have to deal with on a daily basis. But I'll tell you this. Fuck these people. Live your life on your terms or not. You make your decision. I have no authority over you. And neither do these douchebag pastors. Thank you so much for making it this far. This was not an easy one. Uh, If you know somebody who may benefit from watching it, send it their way. And as always, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I love you very much. Work, 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 Sky Moon. (laughs)